Hey Chemistry, Mrs. KJ here going over 3.06 transition metals. So today we're just going to talk a little bit about what I like to call the messy middle transition metals. And we're also going to talk about the inner transition metals. So right here where there's these two empty boxes, that is where these two rows are going to go in. Um, you may remember that I showed you a different periodic table, how these should go right in here, and it's very stretched out, but we put them down below. And we're going to talk about these two groups together called the inner transition metals. So these are the type of metals that you usually think of when you think of a metal. So many can be used for building, whether it's the structure, like what they use to build a bridge out of, or whether it's the interior, like the wires. It can be used in pottery and art. For example, I know some of you are artists and you may have used different glazes on clay and you notice there's different colors and they go along with different transition metals. So we have nickel, cobalt. You might have heard of cobalt blue. It's that really pretty deep blue. Copper, I talked about with the fireworks, gives off green. Um, especially if it's burned, it's a much brighter green than this, but it's still green in the glaze. We have manganese, chromium, iron. And of course, this one was nickel. The other thing about them, um, they can be used for things like jewelry, catalysts to speed up chemical reactions. The big thing is they are not nearly as reactive as the alkali and alkaline earth metals. But regardless of if a metal is an alkali, alkaline earth, or transition metals, they share most of the general properties that we talked about in the last lesson. Like, for example, they are shiny. They are ductile. You can make them into wires. They are malleable. If you hit them with a hammer, they will bend. They are good conductors of heat and good conductors of electricity. All right. One of the most interesting inner transition metals is mercury. It is highly toxic. If you do ever see any in your life, please, please do not touch it. Even just touching it for a little while, it absorbs in your skin and mercury goes into the brain and it basically just sits there. You don't get rid of it. Um, when you have mercury accumulation, it makes a person go crazy and is apparently a very painful death. So long ago, before scientists knew a lot, they would use mercury and other professions did and people would go crazy, literally go crazy. An example of this in real life, or in the book, Alice in Wonderland, you've heard of the Mad Hatter. Well, in real life, people who made a lot of hats out of felt were exposed to trace amounts or little amounts of mercury every day, and eventually it built up in their system, and it could actually cause different neurological disorders, diseases, and yes, they would go crazy and they would die. So again, if you ever see any, don't touch it. It's very, very toxic. That being said, it is also very interesting to see. Um, it is a very cold metal, and it's the only metal that is liquid at room temperature. And it's very, very dense and heavy. So water would float on top of it. This is a steel ball, a ball that if you dropped it in water, it would go sinking instantly to the bottom. Um, another characteristic of mercury is once it drips down and it turns into all kinds of different little beads. And this one is showing that because they're statically charged, they are repelling each other. And mercury, like all metals, is very shiny. And that's a big part of why people, before they knew better, were very attracted to mercury. It's very shiny. It's very cold feeling. It feels wet, but it's not because it's a liquid metal. It's just very different than pretty much anything else on Earth. So again, now that I've told you how awesome it is, and I did that on purpose so that if you do ever see it in real life, you're like, whoa, you remember that? Oh yeah, can't touch this. So um, if you do have sometimes the CFL bulbs, which I hate using because they have mercury inside of them, but if one breaks and you have mercury, you should use paper to scrape it up, kind of like use paper as a broom and dustpan. And then I would tape it all shut and I would call your local city hall and ask them what to do with it. Because we don't want to throw it away. If you throw it away, it gets in your water system and people end up drinking it and getting sick that way. So hopefully you've added all of this to your notes. If you haven't, please hit pause now and add it. And then also add about mercury and the vocabulary word 
alloy. An alloy is a physical mixture of metals such as copper, nickel, and zinc. For example, it's what's used in coins. And so we use a mixture because it is cheaper. Um, we also use mixtures for things because it might help resist tarnishing. It might help it be stronger, all those different reasons. But an alloy is a mixture of different metals. And then in the next part of your notes, um, we can write inner transition metals. So now we're going to talk about the F block or those bottom rows. You do not have to write all this down. Um, I will underline what you need to write down. The inner transition metals are typically silver, silvery white, or gray in color. So pretty standard metal. They are very shiny. Again, standard metal. They react very easily with air, resulting in explosions or tarnishing. These metals are very good conductors. Inner transition metals also react very readily with nonmetals. Many inner transition metals are so similar in properties, they're often hard to tell apart. So you don't have to write that down, but I did want to tell you a little bit about them. All right, so there are two different rows. The first row is the lanthanide series. So please write this down. And it's used for nuclear reactors, lasers, very strong magnets. It's used in medicines to treat the severe pain bone cancer patients may experience. It's used in electronics such as your TV and procedures to test for Down syndrome and other conditions during prenatal exams. So a lot of different uses, and we're just going to put down a few of them in your notes. The second row is the actinide series, atomic numbers 89 through 102. So please add that to your notes. Thorium and uranium can be mined on Earth. And then we have what is called transuranium elements. Let's break this word apart. We have uranium, which you might think of as in uranium bombs, so uranium nuclear power plants. And we have the word part trans. Trans means beyond. So like the transcontinental railroad that you might have learned about in history class. Trans is going beyond where the railroad was and all the way across the United States. And what are those? They are elements with atomic numbers greater than uranium and they are man-made. Okay, so that's very important that some of the elements on our periodic table don't exist naturally. They are man-made. So if we look at our periodic table, we have Neptunium, Plutonium, Americum, Curium, Berkelium, Californium, Einsteinium, Fermium, Mendelavium, Nobelium, Laurentium, and a lot of those are named after very famous scientists or places like Berkeley, California, but those are all man-made. So are these up here. Once we jump back up here, we're up to number 104. All of these have only been found in laboratories where people have made them. Now some of them have three letters and it's unknown because they are still testing. There are scientists who say, hey, we made this one, but they're still testing it all around the world to make sure that other scientists can recreate it and basically believe them and learn more about it. Um, that being said, they exist for less than a second, so it's very instant. So then going back to our vocab word, transuranium beyond. So all of these with atomic numbers greater than uranium are man-made. And then the other thing to write down, actinide series elements have nuclei that are so large they tend to break down through radioactive decay. So if we look at uranium, uranium has a mass number of 238, an atomic number of 92. So how many protons does it have? 92 protons. And how many neutrons? 238 minus 92, 146. There are a lot more neutrons than protons, and that's part of what makes it unstable, and so it breaks apart and it will decay into and break apart into different elements. And we're going to talk a lot more about that in a different unit, but I at least wanted to bring it up now because it was something interesting about them. And so now we've talked about the alkali metals, alkaline earth metals, transition metals, and the inner transition metals. Now, 
if you noticed, we have something over here, and on this periodic table, they call it the basic metal. And I've heard these called poor metals. Poor as in, eh, they're not the best. For our class, we're just going to lump them in with the transition metals, but we are going to talk about this little section right now. And this little section, they list it as a semi-metal. What does semi mean? It means half. So this is a half metal. It's kind of a metal. And in fact, the more common term is a metalloid because oid means similar to. So metalloids are found in a stair-step pattern between the metals and nonmetals. Their properties are in between, kind of like both metals and nonmetals. So write that section down. So specifically, we are talking about boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, sometimes antimony, sometimes tellurium, and some, sometimes polonium are also included. Once they discover and officially agree on number 117, that might be included. Um, I say might be because there's a lot of debate on this. We're not, not going to get that into it as long as you know that these are the metalloids. So again, boron, silicon, germanium are your number one, two, and three examples. So you can add that in. Now, the only other thing I need you to write down is this sentence. So metalloids share many simpler, similar properties. So they're like each other, but they're in between the properties of metals and nonmetals. So they appear to be metal, but they're brittle, like a nonmetal. They can form alloys with metals so they can mix together. Write this one down. Some metalloids, such as silicon and germanium, become electrical conductors under special conditions. These are called semiconductors. It's used in electronics. It's used in your computer. You probably heard of Silicon Valley in California because that's where a lot of these computer chips and all that stuff are made. They use silicon because they can control when it's a good conductor. Usually, metalloids are solid under standard conditions, but they are mostly non-metallic in how they chemically behave. So they're a mixture. They're kind of, which makes sense on where they're put on the periodic table. They are the division line between all our metals and our non-metals.